And now to introduce our program, the Grants Program Director of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Dennis Liu. Welcome to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the final lecture in our series on evolution. Those of you who've watched the previous lectures have probably noticed that David Kingsley and Sean Carroll really like Charles Darwin. Um, Charles Darwin was a fascinating uh, individual, but of course he's a biology hero because of his uh, great idea, this big concept that he was able to formulate called evolution. Now working on evolution today, Sean Carroll, our next speaker, has a lot of advantages that Darwin didn't have, and those have been covered in, in the previous lectures. The fossil record has grown enormously, including lots of important transitional forms. And Darwin, in fact, never even heard the word gene. And now we understand a lot of details about how genes work. And in fact, every human genome, every human gene has been sequenced. In his lecture, Sean, Sean Carroll will go from the genetic control of spots on butterfly wings to the evolution of human brains. And he's going to argue that the mechanisms are very similar, if not the same. best things about my job are I have never, ever been ambivalent about anything that I've done. Uh, I work with the most talented and passionate people you can find. Uh, I meet incredibly interesting people from around the world that do all sorts of things that uh, I could never have imagined, but they're available there to teach you, show you, take you out into the field tell you what drives them. So it's a very intense, continuously mind-expanding experience. I think the most unexpected things that have happened in my laboratory have been, there have been moments of eureka, even reflected by some of these images, where you step up to the microscope, you don't, you don't really have a notion of what you're going to see, but when you look through the microscope, that flash of data instantly changes what you were thinking and simplifies, clarifies all the muck that was running around your brain. I think the ingredients to being a good scientist, uh, part of them are intellectual and part are probably emotional or psychological. On the emotional psychological side, you have to be patient. Most things we do don't work. Most things we test, most experiments, it's not that they fail out of, our, out of stupidity, but they don't reveal what we hope for them to reveal. It's a, it's a long-term process. So this is definitely a marathon. You need more the mentality of a marathoner than a sprinter here. I think intellectually it takes tremendous curiosity. The, the rewards in being a scientist come from having your mind open to new ideas constantly being curious, not looking for uh, preset answers, sort of being prepared for the unexpected. Well, I would just ask any student why they want to pursue a career in science, and if that's because they love it, it's because they can't imagine doing something else, that's a good enough answer for me. And so all they really need to do is just to get exposed to as broad a menu as possible and find out what things on that menu really hit them harder than others. See what that stirs up. And uh, eventually, just uh, follow your gut to whatever area seems to drive you the most. Good morning. Welcome back. The final lecture. I applaud your stamina and your curiosity. One of the common threads running through David's and my lectures are a connection of 21st century science to 19th century science, zigzagging through a bit of the 20th century. Uh, in the 19th century, it was an extraordinary period of scientific exploration and discovery, a lot of mind-opening ex uh, discoveries, a lot of mind-opening works such as Darwin's. Um, but what we're looking for here in the 21st century are <coughs> deeper explanations, deeper understanding, and still sometimes some new revelations, things that we couldn't have imagined before. Not all great discoveries of the 19th century were Darwin's or Darwin's alone, but his theory provided the essential framework. In the context of his theory, new discoveries could be understood. 
In my final lecture, you're going to hear about two more pioneering naturalists, both close allies of Darwin, and how mysteries that first captivated them, from the beautiful markings of butterfly wings to the riddle of human origins, are now being addressed with 21st century technology, 21st century knowledge. The first person I'm going to talk about is Henry Walter Bates. He left to travel in the Amazon to explore the Amazon in 1848. He was Alfred Russell Wallace's traveling companion. These two gentlemen were friends in England. They, like Darwin, dreamed of visiting the tropics. And when they got the chance to go, they went off to the Amazon. And their plan was to make a living as collectors and to earn money to support further work um, by shipping their collections home and, and being paid for them. And Bates was a fantastic collector. He spent much longer in the Amazon than Wallace. They parted. Wallace returned to England briefly and then went on to other parts of the world. But Bates stayed in the Amazon, which not only gave him uh, a tremendous amount of time, 11 years in total, but uh, he lived among its indigenous people, and he had a tremendous fondness and a tremendous bond and rapport um, with the various tribes living in, in South America. And he learned a lot from those indigenous peoples about the local wildlife and the local plants, for example, medicinal purposes, things like this. So finally, he came back to England after 11 years. Um, he came back a, a, little, a little worse for wear. Uh, he'd experienced uh, lots of tropical diseases. Um, he'd been robbed, abandoned by assistants and servants, uh, malnourished, who knows how many insect bites or worse. But he came back with a treasure trove for science. And that booty included 8,000 new species. So of about 14,000 species in his collection, um, most of these new species were insects. So Bates, and you probably know the Amazon is an insect-rich place, um, Bates did a phenomenal job cataloging, collecting, drawing various insects. And the insects that he's best known for uh, are butterflies. Now, Bates, when he got back from the Amazon, he, he, his timing was fantastic. He arrived in the summer of 1859, just months before The Origin of Species was published. And after The Origin of Species was published, he realized that a lot of his observations, a lot of his naturalist work, um, could be better understood in light of Darwin's theory. And he struck up a correspondence with Darwin. And in one letter to Darwin, he wrote, I think I have got a glimpse into the laboratory where nature manufactures her new species. And that glimpse, that flash of insight that Bates had, was into a biological phenomenon called mimicry, and a form of mimicry that we still name after Bates today, called Batesian mimicry. And what Bates identified going on in the Amazon with some of these colorfully patterned butterflies I'm showing you these as species pairs. Each butterfly on the top and bottom is a different species. And one of the pair is an unpalatable form, something that makes manufactures or, or contains in its body some alkaloid substances that are distasteful to birds, and birds will spit them out when they sample them. And what happens is that other species that are palatable that even don't possess these compounds, through the process of natural selection, will come to resemble the unpalatable butterflies. In other words, they're getting a survival advantage by looking like something that's distasteful to birds. And he saw this repeatedly in various groups of butterflies. So this form of mimicry, when Bates explained it to Darwin, Darwin was absolutely delighted. He thought that Bates's paper on mimicry was one of the most remarkable papers he had ever read. And then as Darwin's work unfolded in later years, he would incorporate this additional work from naturalists into the whole fabric of evolution that he was describing. Now, Bates wrote just one book called The Naturalist on the River Amazons. It's still widely available today. You can find it in paperback form. And I encourage you to read books by these 19th century naturalists because they describe a world being sort of discovered, at least by educated Western individuals for the first time. They also describe a world that sadly is not the same as it was 150 years ago. I have a little more to say about that later.